Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie leave number 10 Downing Street for the final time. It was the first act in a carefully choreographed handover of power that saw Liz Truss become Britain's new prime minister. Outside, on the steps of the official residence, Johnson said his final goodbyes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well this, is, this is it, folks. In only a couple of hours, I will be in Balmoral to see Her Majesty the Queen. And the torch will finally be passed to a new Conservative leader. Let me say that I am now like one of those booster rockets that has fulfilled its function. And I will now be gently re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down invisibly in some remote and obscure corner of the Pacific. And I will be supporting Liz Truss and the new government every step of the way. Thank you all very much. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Boris Johnson and Liz Truss then headed to Scotland for the next part of their performance. They visited the Queen at her residence at Balmoral Castle. Johnson was in first to officially tender his resignation. He then left, no longer Prime Minister. And once he was gone, Truss arrived at Balmoral for her audience with the Queen. And the British monarch formally invited her to form a new government. She then headed to her new official residency, Number 10 Downing Street, where she addressed the nation for the first time as Prime Minister. In her speech, she praised her predecessor and vowed to tackle the challenges facing Britain head on. I have just accepted Her Majesty the Queen's kind invitation to form a new government. Now is the time to tackle the issues that are holding Britain back. As Prime Minister, I will pursue three early priorities. Firstly, I will get Britain working again. Secondly, I will deal hands-on with the energy crisis caused by Putin's war. Thirdly, I will make sure that people can get doctor's appointments and the NHS services they need. We will put our health service on a firm footing. I am determined to deliver. Thank you. And Quentin Peel is with me now to talk about the new British Prime Minister. He's an associate fellow with the Europe program at the Chatham House Think Tank. Mr. Peel, good to see you. The list of promises is long. How will Liz Truss go about delivering? Well, she's basically got to stand on their heads most of the things that she promised during her campaign. She said she's going to go for tax cuts and no subsidies. In fact, she's going to have to have enormous subsidies to try and put a cap on the energy prices. And she's going to have to spend a huge amount of money on the National Health Service, on defence. Uh, so actually, she's going to be quite a spender and not a saver. She lost no time to reshuffle the cabinet, did she? Hers is very diverse, quite young, very much out of her own wing of the party. Did she pick the right team for the right ahead? Well, it's certainly been criticised already as being quite lightweight, not particularly experienced, although in many ways it looks quite like the, the Johnson government that it replaces. So there are quite a lot of people there who were in the former government, although several heavyweights have gone, like the Deputy Prime Minister, for example, Dominic Raab. And... Uh, She's brought in people who were clearly her supporters and it's quite clear that she's rewarding their loyalty. Um, the other most interesting thing is really that the three biggest jobs in government have all gone to members of ethnic minorities. You've got a black Chancellor of the Exchequer in Kwasi Kwarteng, um, a black Foreign Secretary in James Cleverley, and a British Asian, 
uh, Suella Braverman as the Home Secretary. That's quite striking in terms of the normal male white cabinets that the British have seen. The Conservative Party is in a bad state, though, deeply divided. Will she be able to get everyone to rally around her, you think? She's going to have a real struggle, I think. I mean, this this succession battle and the replacement of Johnson has been a very miserable and bitter affair. They've been squabbling very openly, and she didn't get a resounding endorsement in her election. I mean, actually, she didn't even get half the members of the Conservative Party to back her, and she got quite a poor showing also from members of Parliament. So she's going to have quite a struggle. It's possible that she may not last very long if she can't hold her party together. But she has a big majority in Parliament, thanks to the majority that Boris Johnson won at the last election, 80-seat majority, which should see her through. The danger being that when you've got a big majority, people feel much more able to rebel against you. So she's going to have to woo people quite assiduously. She's going to have to work very hard at this. And as you perhaps heard from her speech, she's not a very persuasive sort of person. She's rather dull, very different to Boris Johnson in that way. She doesn't have any of his humour and his flair. Let's zoom out a bit. What does her appointment as Prime Minister mean for the UK's position in the world? Well, um... I fear that it doesn't mean a huge amount of change. I mean, she has made her name a bit at the foreign ministry as somebody who was tough towards the European Union. She's the one who's tabled the legislation to scrap the so-called Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a vital piece of legislation to enable the whole trade, trade situation with the European Union to work properly. If she's going to scrap that against the signing that Boris Johnson did of it, then that's going to poison relations with the European Union. The question the question is, will she change her mind? And the truth is, we don't really know. This is a woman who looks, on the one hand, as a very ideological sort of person. But on the other hand, she was once a Remainer. She wanted to stay in the EU. And then she became a fierce Brexiter. Somebody wanted to leave the EU. And I think we're going to have to wait and see how she works out in power.